I might as well start. Um, so in June, uh, we talked about um, kind of some of the first airlines that serviced Edmonton in the 1930s. And I think we concluded that lecture talking about TransCanada Air Airlines uh, coming to town. Uh, we touched on Grant McConaughey's rebranding of uh, United Air Transport to Yukon Southern Air Transport and his acquisition of Barclay Grows. We're going to revisit that stuff a little bit today, uh, but mostly we're going to be covering the Second World War and Edmonton specifically during the Second World War, kind of on the home front. So in July, we talked about Edmonton, Edmonton serving, sorry, Edmontonian serving overseas. Today, uh, we'll really mainly focus about Edmonton, uh, but really I'm going to do kind of more of a deep dive into the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan um, and kind of the specifics of what the plan was, what all the different schools did, and uh, how it was kind of organized across Canada. So the BCATB stuff will not necessarily be specific to Edmonton, but we'll talk about uh, it just in general. So to set the stage, September, September 1939, uh, war, breaks out, war, break, excuse me, war breaks out in Europe. Uh, Germany obviously invades Poland, later France. Uh, Canada declared war on the 3rd of September. And even though the war didn't necessarily catch everybody by surprise, kind of saw it coming a little bit, uh, Canada and the rest of the Commonwealth definitely wasn't quite prepared to deal with the rapid onslaught of the German infants. So by December, mid-December, so on the 16th and 17th, uh, there was a group of men that met in Prime Minister Mackenzie King's office to sign uh, what was called an agreement relating to the training of pilots and aircraft crews in Canada and their subsequent service. So this agreement was signed between the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and by the end of the war, it would contribute to the training of 130,000 aircrew for the air forces of the Allies. And the origin of that what was later called the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan uh, is really kind of tangled up in the really complex web of the relations between all the different air forces of the Commonwealth and more specifically UK and Canada. Uh, during the First World War we had many Canadians that served in the Royal Naval Air Service and the Royal Flying Corps, which both of them became the Royal Air Force in 1918. We had 22,000 uh, 22, Canadians that served in both services. And even after the formation of the Canadian Air Force and the Royal Canadian Air Force, Canadians were still able to apply to the Royal Air Force in the UK. And that was especially popular in the 30s, uh, I think I mentioned that previously, because budget cuts were hitting pretty bad in Canada, uh, hitting the RCAF pretty bad, and even though they were training a lot of air crew, they didn't really have any positions for them. And because of the Depression, there was definitely a lack of jobs for bush pilots, so a lot of people ended up going overseas and serving in the RAF in the 1930s. So the picture here is a uh, front page of the Edmonton Bulletin uh, talking about the war beginning in September. One of those bush pilots was Paul Devout. He graduated from the Royal Military College. He won the Sword of Honor at Camp Borden in 1931, uh, which essentially means he was the top ranking student of that year. He was uh, individually sponsored by the chief of the general staff. But when he graduated, he found out that there was absolutely no chance of getting into the RCAF and finding an actual job. So in 1931, they graduated 25 pilots and they only found an appointment for one of those 25. So a lot of them left for Britain. Um, and by 1939, there were more Canadian pilots in the RAF than there were in the RCAF. By the mid thirties, Germany was really rapidly expanding their air force um, and Britain approved seven new training facilities, but recognized pretty early on that if war came, those training facilities would be pretty overwhelmed and they would probably need more. And so they chose Canada to be kind of their, their arm of this training facility. Why? Canada was relatively close to the United Kingdom. Uh, it had a good proximity to the industrial resources of the United States relatively good weather, a lot of open area. Um, but initially the idea of these RAF training facilities located in Canada didn't really go over particularly well with the Canadian government. Uh, this was a tricky time in Canada. We were trying to exercise our sovereignty and um, this idea of, oh yeah, we'll just set up training bases in your country didn't necessarily sit well with the Canadian government. So the compromise that they agreed on was uh, training facilities in Canada, but then operating under Canadian control. 
Um, so, sorry, this photo here is uh, Alfred Balfour. Uh, he is the one that ended up coming up with this idea. So, at the beginning of the Second World War, the government of the United Kingdom appealed to Canada to substantially increase air training facilities. Um, essentially, they wanted us to train about 2,000 pilots a year uh, and about as many air gunners and observers as possible right off the bat. And then as the reality of the Second World War set in and, and the idea that, oh, this war was actually probably going to be lasting quite a bit longer and uh, was a lot more deadly than they expected, with only two weeks, uh, they amended that request uh, and increased it by four times as many. So they wanted to train 8,000 pilots a year uh, and as many observers and air gunners as they possibly could. So the negotiations for the BCATP between the four governments, so Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the UK, uh, took place in Ottawa uh, in late 1939. So the, the agreement, which is sometimes called the Ottawa Agreement or the Riverdale Agreement after Lord Riverdale, uh, was officially signed on the 17th of December, 1939. So Balfour's proposal um, initially called for the training of 850 pilots, 510 air observers or navigators, 870 wireless operators slash air gunners every four weeks for 29,000 aircrew per year. So he wanted elementary flying training schools to be established in all of the dominions, um, but then all advanced flying training and air observer and wireless operators training was to be done in Canada. So uh, elementary flying in the UK, sorry, in um, Australia and New Zealand, but all the advanced training to be done in Canada. So the initial agreement was we were gonna have 12 elementary flying training schools 25 advanced or service, trying, service flying training schools, 15 air observer schools, 15 bombing and gunnery schools, three air navigation schools, uh, and then they did the math and figured out that to crew these schools and the organization of this entire arrangement, uh, they would need about 54,000 air personnel very rapidly. So Canada absolutely balked at the cost and they pushed back substantially for the United Kingdom to financially contribute a lot more to this agreement. Um, because initially Canada, or initially the idea was, well, it's on Canadian soil and Canadians want more control, so Canada should pay for it. So then the, the compromise that got signed was that uh, in order to help Canada out, the United Kingdom would buy more Canadian wheat. Um, and then they also shifted more of the trading facilities to, the Aust to Australia and New Zealand to kind of balance things out a little bit. The final estimated cost was $607 million from, for the program, which uh, if you convert it into today's figures is about twelve and a quarter billion dollars. They estimated that they needed about 3,540 aircraft, so 720 Harvards for training fighter pilots, almost 1,400 Ansons for pilots and observers, uh, 750 ferry battles for wireless operator and air gunners. The Canadian government would oversee the BCATP and the RCAF would be the military primarily in charge of the program. The launch date was set for the 29th of April 1940 uh, with initially number one initial training school in Toronto to open and then all the remaining schools would open progressively month by month with the idea that the whole program would be operational by April of 1942. Which seems like an um, almost impossible task, um, but somehow they managed to get it done. So once the agreement was signed, they had this kind of ridiculously enormous task of recruiting everybody and building all of these air bases across the entire country. So there was a huge director of works and buildings set up to oversee, oversee the construction of hangars, drill halls, barracks blocks, runways, uh, all across the country. The Department of Transport uh, was involved very, very early on, mainly because of their experience with airport construction in the 30s. So they were chosen uh, to essentially select airfield sites. And then once they were approved by the RCAF, uh, the DOT was the ones to develop the airport uh, as far as the runways go and, and the lights and the airport improvements. But the Royal Canadian Air Force would be the ones to actually erect the buildings and build the hangars. So including main aerodromes and relief fields for emergency landings, they needed 125 flying fields in Canada. The Department of Transport offered 24 airports uh, that needed just like basic buildings to make them suitable for training, 15 intermediate fields that needed 
quite a bit more extensive modifications, um, which left 80 brand new airports that needed to be built from scratch. So where? Um, they decided that sites that were closer than five miles to the United States border were ruled out. Um, anyone, any mountainous terrain was ruled out. Bombing and gunnery schools needed 100 square mile areas where training wouldn't endanger lives or property. Navigation schools needed variable terrain, um, large bodies of water nearby, hopefully. Um, but also they wanted to pick sites that long-term had a potential value either for post-war military uh, efforts or as a civilian air airport. So they didn't want to just build a giant facility in the middle of nowhere. They recognized that later on they'd have to repurpose these facilities. They split it up into four main training uh, schemes. So number one training command was Toronto, number two was Winnipeg, number three was in Montreal, and number four was in Regina. Number four controlled Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC, and it moved to Calgary in September of 1941. And so civilian aviation contributed quite significantly to the BC ATP, and primarily through the Canadian Flying Clubs Association. So they were the ones that undertook the operation of the elementary flying training schools. Um, so this split up the elementary tra flying training schools initially from six, 13 large ones to 26 smaller ones. Uh, to do that, each club had to raise about $35,000, um, essentially through memberships, to demonstrate that they were stable, had uh, you know a, a good member base, and they could apply to and essentially run an EFTS. And then civilian aviation companies formed an agreement with the government to operate the Air Observer Schools. Uh, the instruction, though, at the Air Observer Schools was a Royal Canadian Air Force responsibility. So all the instructors at the AOSs were members of the service, but the schools were organized by civilians um, and run by a civilian manager. And so in the case of number two AOS here in Edmonton, Watt May was the civilian manager. The pilots that were flying the aircraft were civilian contractors of uh, Canadian Airways or Canadian Pacific, but the actual training of the navigators was done by Royal Canadian Air Force personnel on board those aircraft. Um, by mid-1940, uh, as the BCATP was coming online, the war was also ramping up, uh, and it really prompted Canada to accelerate its plans. So most of the uh, schools were actually opened several months sooner than they were actually expected. There was a lot of rumors in the press, especially the American press at the time, that they were massively behind and it was a complete boondoggle. Uh, so it really forced the government to kind of scramble, put out a lot of, a lot of press releases saying that, no, actually, they're ahead of schedule and very well organized, um, which is kind of surprising considering how much of an effort it really took. Uh, and then there was a bit of a panic when the Royal Air Force asked to move four of their service flying training schools to Canada in the summer of 1940, since the war was starting to go fairly poorly and they'd be a lot safer in Canada. Thankfully, because we were well on our way to implementing our plan, uh, we had, you know, room for them uh, and so it wasn't a significant ask and we were able to accommodate them as long as the United Kingdom paid for them of course. Uh, civilian aviation in Canada was also critical uh, as far as repairing these aircraft. So in 1941 they formed the Department of Munitions and Supply uh, to create the um, overhaul and repair division. So it really embraced civilian firms across the country uh, and employed about 18,000 men and women to help service and maintain all of these aircraft for the BC ATP. So by the end of the war, that division serviced 6,500 aircraft uh, and about 30,500 engines by the end of the war. And so I've got a map here just of Alberta showing all of the BC ATP facilities uh, in Edmonton, or sorry, in Alberta. Uh, so in Edmonton, we've got number four, Initial Training School, number 16, Elementary Flying Training School, and number two, Air Observer School. Penhold, um, so Red Deer has number 36 service flying training school and number 32 elementary flying training school in Bowdoin. Uh, and I won't read the rest off, but you can see there's quite a bit more in Southern Alberta uh, and Edmonton is kind of the Northern end of this. So several more in Calgary, including service flying training schools, wireless school in Calgary, uh, elementary flying in DeWinton, service tra flying training school in Vulcan. There's also a flight instructor school in Vulcan. 
Claris Holm, Medicine Hat, Pierce, McLeod, and Lethbridge. So mostly in southern Alberta. So the first stop, if you were if you were a recruit to the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, was a recruiting center, uh, and then to a Manning Depot. So this was uh, where the start of the air crew selection program began. If you wanted to be a pilot, you had to be a maximum of six foot three, and a maximum of 200 pounds. Initially, you had to be between the ages of 18 and 28, and later as the war went on, they relaxed that and they stretched it to 17 to 35. During the first two years of the program, you had to have junior matriculation, which meant grade 12 in BC and Ontario, or grade 11 everywhere else. So not exactly, not a high school graduate, but close to a high school graduate. Later though, because they were needing more and more pilots, they ended up replacing that with just a psychological test. So they didn't really care how high you'd get, gotten in high school. You did a psychological test, and as long as you proved you, right, had, you had the right temperament, uh, then they would put you through, and then put you through accelerated academic training in order to get up to that level. So recruits would typically spend about four to five weeks in a Manning Depot. And here in Edmonton, we had number three Manning Depot at the exhibition grounds. So that's the photo that was on the front cover. So this is the number three Manning Depot. It was pretty strenuous work. Uh, there was a lot of interviews, a lot of testing, a lot of lectures, hours and hours of drilling in the parade square, um, and all of the boring nonsense like polishing boots, keeping your uniform tidy, your bed made, your face, face shaved, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a aerial photo from 1943 showing where number three Manning Depot is. Uh, and then overlaid on a modern Google Maps, you can see that uh, it is at the exhibition grounds. So uh, here, I'll show this map is a little bit better. So you can see there's 111th Avenue. Uh, this is Borden Park in the middle. The horse race track uh, essentially roughly corresponds to the track uh, at the Manning Depot. And then there was all sorts of uh, H outs and barracks around for the Manning Depot. After that, you would go to an, init an initial training school. Uh, so this is if you were chosen for the pilot navigator route. Here you'd get pre-flight instruction in aerodynamics, engines, navigation, meteorology, mathematics, science, uh, and number four was at Corporate Hall and the dorms at the University of Alberta. Initially, this initial training school phase lasted about four weeks, but as the war went on, they decided that this initial training program was actually much more important than they initially realized. Uh, they realized it was, it was very important to establish this baseline experience, so it was given a lot higher priority as the war went on, and this ITS period was stretched out to 10 weeks from four weeks. Uh, and this is where most of the sorting went on as far as sorting you into different air crew categories. And it was broadly split up into pilot or navigator. So for those that had physical and educational backgrounds uh, and everybody, are, everybody else ended up getting split off to be wireless operators or air gunners. So here's some of the elementary flying training schools. So if you wanted to learn to be a pilot and you got selected for that, you'd go to an elementary flying training school. So number 16 here in Edmonton, uh, there's also number six in Prince Albert, number 15 in Regina, number five in Lethbridge, uh, and several all the way across the country. So all the way from Vancouver, all the way east to the Maritimes, including number 21 in Chatham, um, number 17 in uh, Nova Scotia, Stanley, Nova Scotia. So at the elementary flying training school, this is when pilots would actually see their first airplane. They'd meet their flight instructors, um, and then over eight weeks, they'd get about 50 hours of flying time and 126 hours of ground lectures. In 1940, they, cut it, they started to cut that back to seven weeks of flying time rather than eight, uh, and then they pushed it back to eight weeks in 1941 because they realized it wasn't quite enough. The amount of flying time increased to 60 hours, uh, but you only had a maximum of 75 hours for slow learners. So if you went beyond 75 hours and you weren't graduated yet, they washed you out. And after only eight hours of dual instruction, you were expected to be ready to do solo, which is pretty quick. If you showed the right attitude, though, they were fairly lenient on you. 
Uh, initially, your attitude and your demeanor really, really, really counted for a lot. And so they were a bit too lenient on certain pilots. Uh, and those not quite qualified pilots ended up being passed, like being graduated if they showed what they thought was the right stuff. But then when those not quite qualified pilots ended up dying more often, they realized that being lenient wasn't really the best practice and they started to become much more strict on this, this practice. So once completed, uh, once they graduated from an elementary flying training school, pilots were expected to carry out what was considered all normal aircraft maneuvers confidently and satisfactorily. They needed to land consistently well, uh, to fly by the aid of instruments, and complete a cross-country flight designed to test their skills in map reading and navigation. On the ground, they spent a bunch of time in the link trainer, uh, which is a very sophisticated flight simulator for the time, uh, in order to master instrument flying techniques. They also spent a lot of time in the classroom on aircraft identification. Early on in the war, uh, in the Battle of Britain, there was a few tragic moments when uh, Allied pilots ended up intercepting Allied pilots. Uh, there was a hurricane squadron that ended up shooting down several returning hurricanes uh, at the early stages of the Battle of Britain. So they realized that aircraft identification was pretty important. So as I mentioned, number 16 elementary flying training school was here in Edmonton, and it was operated by the Edmonton Flying Club. It opened here at the municipal airport on the 11th of November, 1940. And it was pretty quickly realized that in order to maximize the efficiency of this plan, they really needed to contract all of the elementary flying training schools out to the flying clubs in Canada. So let the flying clubs operate uh, and then just subsidize their expenses. Oops, sorry. This idea of having a civilian manager ended up working out significantly more, like it was significantly better than they ever expected. Any profits, so the, the government would pay the flying schools, and any profits that the flying schools earned from this had to be reinvested in war bonds, etc., and back into the war effort. But the flying clubs had so much experience, you know, in the, say, 13 years that they'd been operating, that they were really efficient at running this, this flying training service. So the military actually vastly overestimated the cost that it would take to run these elementary flying training schools, and the flying clubs ended up making tons and tons of money, which I mentioned didn't go back to them as profit, it was reinvested in war bonds, uh, but eventually the government just decided, you know what, these guys are too efficient, let's just not even pay them at all, and uh, we'll just call it good. Why was it so cheap? All of the flying clubs had established networks. They had um, people that could repair things easily. They knew where to get parts. Uh, they always they had a guy, so they didn't have to go through the military bureaucracy of being able to fix their aircraft. So they could skip all of that red tape and do things much more efficiently than the government. By the end of the war, of the almost 60,000 pilot training schools in the elementary flying training schools, um, about 13,200 failed to graduate for reasons other than sickness, injury, or death. So about 22.5%. So, you know, about 77.5% of them graduated. Uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say 77.5. I can't remember exactly how many died, uh, graduated, because obviously some of them graduated, but didn't graduate for reasons of sickness, injury, or death. But yeah, about 22.5% washed out. Flying clubs, as I mentioned, could buy whatever they needed without bureaucracy, and they enjoyed a lot of support from their local communities. So uh, they were able, if they were having problems, they were able to go to the local community for support, and fundraisers, and that kind of thing. In 1940 to 41, the clubs had enough civilian instructors to keep everyone going. Um, they had their regular older members that were in the club. Uh, they had bush flyers that they could contract as flight instructors. But so many people wanted to be posted overseas and become fighter pilots, bomber pilots, transport pilots, that it was actually really, really difficult to keep qualified instructors at home. And that became a, a really significant problem as the war went on. So later on, the Royal Canadian Air Force had to actually post military personnel to these flying clubs uh, as instructors in order to fill, up, fill these gaps. When the war uh, in the Pacific really ramped up, they decided that they needed to expand the air observer schools. Uh, and so they started closing a lot of the elementary flying training schools. So they closed five of them, 
Number 16, Elementary Flying Training School closed on the 17th of July, 1942. Um, and when that shuffle happened, a lot of flying clubs ended up, um, so there was a, a shuffle, they closed some, and they ended up moving some to different parts of the country. And so because they'd been operated by flying clubs, some of these flying clubs actually had to pack up their entire operation, including all of their staff, all of their families, and move across country. So number one, elementary flying training school moved from Malton near Toronto to DeWinton in southern Alberta. So the Toronto Flying Club moved all of their family, all of their aircraft, everything, all the way from Toronto to DeWinton. So Malton closed on the 29th of June, and DeWinton opened on the 13th of July, two weeks later. So pretty remarkable. And I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've been to DeWinton, but there's not much in DeWinton. It's relatively co close to Southern Calgary now, but back then it was definitely not particularly close to Southern Calgary. So of course, the aircraft that they were using primarily for the elementary flying training schools was the Tiger Moth. Um, and I included this quote in our souvenir booklet from Roald Dahl, who learned to fly in a Tiger Moth during the Second World War. So he said, the Tiger Moth is a, is a thing of great beauty. A Tiger Moth had no vices. She never have dropped a wing if you lost flying speed coming into land, and she would suffer innumerable heavy landings from incompetent beginners without turning a hair. So de Havilland developed this Tiger Moth, uh, the de Havilland DH-82 Tiger Moth, in the early 30s, uh, as another variation of their very popular de Havilland 60 Moth trainer. The Moth was built as a trainer for flying clubs, um, and the Tiger Moth was essentially a refinement of the Moth. So it included a larger Gypsy Major engine. Uh, they ended up inverting the engine so that uh, the cylinders are actually underneath the engine compared to the Moth, which offered much better visibility for the pilots. They swept the wings back, which allowed easier access to the front cockpit. And uh, the British one was completed in the 1930s. It became the primary Commonwealth trainer. And in 1937, de Havilland Canada started building a version, a Canadian version in Toronto. So that's what de Havilland 82C, which is what we have in the museum. Uh, and de Havilland Canada ended up building about 1,500 of these Canadian Tiger Moths by the end of the war. So the 82C had a more powerful engine, the Gypsy Major. It had an enclosed and heated cockpit, so you could fly it year-round. And it had provisions for skis, a tail wheel, and wheel brakes uh, to meet Canadian conditions. So during the war, they were paving much more of the runways in Canada. And earlier aircraft, like the Moth, had a tail skid. So when you land on a grass strip, the tail skid digs into the grass and, and ends up slowing you down and stopping you. But if you land on pavement, uh, it doesn't really do that. And so it's very dangerous to land with a tail skid on a paved runway. So the Canadian tail moths ended up fitting wheel brakes and a tail wheel. So our Tiger Moth uh, arrived in Edmonton in 1942. It served with number 16 elementary flying training school. And then after the war, the Royal Canadian Air Force sold pretty much most of their Tiger Moths to the Royal Canadian Flying Clubs in order to use them as uh, civilian trainers. So our aircraft went to flying clubs in Ontario from 1945 to 1954. It's put in storage. Um, after about 27 years, it was purchased and restored. Uh, and uh, I think the restoration was finished in 1981. Norman Reed ended up buying the Tiger Moth in 1996. Uh, he had been training on a Tiger Moth. He wanted to be a pilot. He ended up serving as a navigator, but he'd always wanted to learn to fly again. So he bought the Tiger Moth uh, and he and a friend ended up flying it across the country. So it was a 4,400 kilometer journey. Um, the Tiger Moth doesn't have particularly good range, so they ended up landing in a lot of fields to refuel. Uh, flew it for another 10 years and ended up donating it to the Alberta Aviation Museum in 2006. So returning it to its first home here in Edmonton. If you've been to the uh, Royal Alberta Museum downtown, you'll see they also have a Tiger Moth hanging upstairs in the in their history gallery, or not upstairs, downstairs in their history gallery. Um, and they have a lot of artifacts from Mike Kooten, who is a former volunteer here at the museum. And I can't remember if I've told this story or not, uh, but they have a lot of good panels about Mike Kooten. They tell a pretty interesting story. So Mike was learning to fly uh, in a Tiger Moth. He wanted to be a pilot, and he went up 
on a solo flight and he was practicing stalls and spins. So he put the Tiger Moth into a spin, it started falling, and then he realized that his uh, harness was not quite done up. So the Tiger Moth fell and he went to the very top of his harness, got snagged, thankfully, didn't fall out of the aircraft. But obviously, if you know anything about flying, uh, to recover from a spin, you need to kick opposite rudder from where you're spinning, which means you need to reach the pedals. So he'd fallen so far out on his loose harness that he couldn't reach the pedals. So he fell all the way down to almost the ground before he could grab, him, grab his harness, pull himself back into the cockpit, stomp on the rudder, recover, pull out of the dive about treetop level, uh, and he described it as a religious experience. And that's when he decided that God was telling him that he really should not be a pilot. So that was his moment, and he said, you know what, maybe I am better off being a navigator. And he became a very excellent navigator, uh, one of the top Canadian navigators in the Second World War, and was chosen to lead a couple of, uh, of the Thousand Bomber raids on Europe. So, as I mentioned, the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan needed to build facilities all across the country in order to surface these airfields. So this is an aerial photograph of Edmonton's airport in 1930. So you can see it's pretty basic. Um, you've got Kingsway here. Uh, this is 118th Avenue. Uh, the shack, this is even before Hangar 1 was built. So the shack is here and there's a couple of grass runways here. This is early 1940. Uh, this is the three British Commonwealth Air Training Plan facilities for number two Air AOS and number 16 EFDS. So they needed three and then later four hangars for the program. These hangars, of course, are no longer here, um, but this dark patch here is where the Alberta Aviation Museum was built. So in addition to the hangars, there was also uh, barracks and H huts on the north side of Kingsway, and then eventually it expanded on the south side of Kingsway, and there was a significant base on the south side of Kingsway. And on the right, you can see the first three hangars. So number one hangar, number two hangar, and number three hangar that was built for Trans-Canada Airways. So these were the only three civilian hangars, major civilian hangars that were built until the military came in and massively expanded the airport during the war. And to put this photo into context, I tried to match it up. Obviously the uh, hangars are no longer there, but you can see the position of where the museum is. Uh, these are some of the more modern hangars that were there, and of course the modern control tower uh, in Kingsway in the background. So there's kind of a comparison shot. Once you've finished your elementary flying training school, you might go to a service flying training school. Each service flying training school, and we didn't have any in Edmonton, had three hard surface runways in a triangular pattern. So if you drive around the prairie, um, and most of these were built in the prairie because it was easy to build airports, the climate was good, it was wide open for practice flying. Uh, so if you drive around the prairies, you might come across many of these old air bases, either abandoned or still in use. Um, so I know a bunch of you went on a road trip recently to Vulcan. Uh, so Vulcan was the home to number two flying instructor school, as well as 19 service flying training school. The service flying training schools, unlike the AOSs and the EFTSs, were entirely RCAF run. This is where you did your intermediate and advanced training. So to turn pilots into fighter pilots, they would be sent to an SFTS that were equipped with single engine larger aircraft like the North American Harvard. Or if you were going to become a bomber pilot or in coastal command or a transport pilot, you'd go to an SFTS that was equipped with twin engine aircraft like Anson's, Cessna Cranes, or Airspeed Oxfords. They did take some personal preference into account. So if you wanted to be a fighter pilot or you wanted to be a bomber pilot, they did take that into account. Uh, but then when most people were opting for the fighter pilot role, uh, they had obviously requirements for other pilots and they overrode their personal preferences. Initially, they also had a shortage of Ansons. So a lot of people went more to the Harvards early on in the war, but when the Canadian Ansons started being built, they were able to train more twin engine pilots. Each of these aircraft was a giant step up from the Tiger Moth. Uh, and when you went to an SCFTS, you had seven weeks of training um, from relearning to take off and land the new aircraft. First solo again, instrument flying, maneuvers, emergency procedures. Uh, if you were flying a twin engine aircraft, you focused a lot on cross-country navigation flights, long distance flights, significantly more instrument flying, 
reconnaissance missions, um, sketching your own maps, formation flying, doing simulated bombing runs, night flying. Uh, and then once you got through those initial steps, you focused on maximum performance flying. It was very, very strict um, instructions and, and very, very precise flying. Uh, but still, people ended up pushing things and uh, some people got washed out because they wanted to kind of prove themselves too much and uh, got into trouble. So the kind of top gun mentality of people not necessarily goofing off but trying to prove themselves and getting into trouble uh, is definitely something that happened quite a bit during the war. So after this, um, you'd go to either a general reconnaissance training school or an operational training unit. Uh, and then you get posted to the war. So here's Vulcan. Here's that very distinct triangular paved runway that you'll see uh, at a lot of British Commonwealth Air Training Place Air Training Plan bases in Canada. So if you ended up going the other route, uh, and of course there was a lot of jobs for other aircrew, so observers, navigators, bomb aimers, wireless operators, air gunners, flight engineers. Uh, early on in the war, navigation, well, and before the war, navigation chores were really shared between the pilot and co-pilot, typically the co-pilot, and there were no non-pilot navigators in the Royal Canadian Air Force before 1942. So the BCAPP made provision for 10 air observer schools uh, in order to graduate 340 air observers per month uh, with the goal of 4,000 a year. Most of these were located at municipal airfields and they were often shared with an elementary flying training school like here in Edmonton. As I mentioned earlier, these were contracted out to civilian aviation companies. So the Air Force provided basic facilities and major equipment like the Ansons. The companies were responsible for the housekeeping, administration, clearance of the runways. Uh, they were the ones to hire and select civilian pilots. And the civilian pilots were the ones that were actually flying the instructors during their training flights but the actual instruction was done by RCAF personnel. So if you went this route uh, to become, say, a navigator, your initial instruction began at an initial training school like a pilot. Um, you were mainly focused on working on compasses, sextants, drift recorders, uh, navigation computers, uh, calculating airspeed versus ground speed, um, understanding track and drift, and once you got to the AOS, you had to master the art of dead reckoning. So master all of those calculations, very accurate measurements, um, and all of those rules of thumb that navigators use to calculate uh, courses, calculate, you know, compensate for wind speed, and that kind of thing. Uh, and you had to do it all without the use of an external aid, uh, like a computer. So it was a lot of manual math. Uh, even though they had basic flight computers, you had to do it manually. Um, all of these plotting exercises were made progressively more difficult, uh, taking into account crosswinds, shifting winds, various altitudes, various conditions. So all done on pen and paper. Uh, and then once it got to more and more complicated, they were allowed to use start. They were starting to be able to use um, mechanical computers and compasses. Once they did that, they went on to uh, radio navigation, so with direction finding equipment and astro navigation. But this was considered, so the radio navigation and the astro navigation was really considered a check on the dead reckoning. So they relied entirely on dead reckoning and all of these other techniques were just kind of a, a backup. You spent 12 weeks at an air observer school. So each student logged about 60 to 70 hours in the air. Flights began with map reading lessons. Um, so trying to identify features on the ground based on looking at the map. They developed skills for estimating distances, calculating bearings, uh, determining in actual conditions what the wind, wind velocity was, how much their aircraft was drifting, what their ground speed was, uh, and then keeping track of their aircraft, plotting out their course, checking calculations with radio equipment, astro readings, all that kind of stuff. Often in the middle of the flight, they were told to throw out their orders. They were given entirely new orders and they had to do everything on the fly in the middle of the aircraft in the middle of their training flight. So it was a lot of like really practical, hands-on, uh, you know, oh crap, things are changing in the middle of the war kind of situations. Uh, 
After this, they'd get posted to a bombing and gunnery school or an intensive instruction on air navigation and astro navigation. And after 1942, they started realizing that um, their bombers were missing their targets almost constantly. So after 1942, uh, Air Marshal Arthur Harris added the bomb aimer to the crews of medium and heavy bombers to relieve the observer from the tasks of visually pinpointing the target, guiding the pilot, operating the bomb site, and dropping the bombs. So before that, on medium and heavy bombers, the navigator was actually also the bomb aimer. And they decided, you know what, let's split this off and make each person specialized, uh, and hopefully we'll actually be able to hit our targets a lot more. So this ended up changing observers to navigators um, and bomb aimers. Navigators ended up, after this, not going to bombing and gunnery schools. There was much more emphasis on Morse code. Um, and if you were on a lighter bomber, there was some specialization. So you could be a navigator bomber or a navigator wireless uh, gunner. So navigator bombers went to bombing and gunnery schools, and they ended up getting employed on medium or smaller bombers, like flying boats, torpedo bombers, and navigator wireless operators were on faster twin-engine aircraft like Mosquitoes. Uh, number two Air AOS here in Edmonton in July of 1942 had a trainee population of just over 200. By March of 1943, it was about 400. Um, and then in, in July of 1943, they built new accommodation and they were expanded, able to expand it up to 645 pupils. They had a staff of about 200, and, uh, Air Force staff of about 200, and civilian staff of 1,000. So it's a huge operation here in Edmonton. And as I mentioned earlier, the civilian manager of number two AOS was Watt May. So when Ottawa called him up and said, you know, are you well, ready to uh, serve your country once again? He was a little despondent because by then he was grounded and he couldn't fly, uh, but he, did some thinking and he decided, well, I've got to do my duty. Uh, so these are some of the other staff at number two AOS. Uh, in the north, or in the top left, is Leonard Saul. He is the Royal Canadian Air Force Supervisor. In the middle is Watt May, who's the manager. Top right is Jack Leichert, who's the facility superintendent. Uh, bottom left is Pat Brooks, who is the secretary. Middle is Dr. Kelly Cohen, who is the doctor, medical doctor for number two AOS. And bottom right is Murray Hammond, who also was the secretary. So when he's chosen, his first duty was to go to number one Air Observer School at Malton, learn how their operations worked, come back to Edmonton, and take those lessons and set up number two AOS. In the early 1940s, so he had been working for Canadian Airways at the time, uh, in the 40s, the Canadian Pacific Railway Company purchased uh, in a very short time period 10 different bush operations. So Ginger Coot Airways, Southern Transport, uh, Prairie Airways, Mackenzie Air Service here in Edmonton, um, Starrett Airways, Quebec Airways, Montreal Dominion Skyways, uh, and then eventually Canadian Airways in 1942, uh, which was the, the largest of those. So when they purchased Canadian Airways, they reformed uh, all 10 of these companies together to form Canadian Pacific Airlines. Most of the early managers were people we would know as early bush flying pioneers, um, the president was Grant McConaughey. Well, sorry, Yukon Southern was one of the ones that was purchased. So Grant McConaughey was the president, Punch Dickens was the superintendent, and Watt May became the de de uh, repair depot manager in Calgary. So he was very involved here at number two AOS. This is an early graduating class uh, and an Anson one behind them. The Anson at the museum is a Mark II Anson, and we only had one, a single Mark II Anson at number two AOS in the entire war. Um, so it's unfortunate we have a Mark II and not a Mark I. Here is a satellite photo of the airport in July of 1943. Um, you'll see that there's been quite a lot of expansion. So uh, I, I didn't mention er earlier, but in 1930, uh, the 118th Ave crossed the airport, so they expanded it. They paved the runways during the war, so this is in the middle of paving the runways. They ended up putting in the new runway at 3-4 here. These are the three British Commonwealth Air Training Plan hangars along Kingsway and all of the H huts. It's now expanded to the other side of Kingsway, so where the Nonsuch is and Superstore. Uh, but still missing in this photo is the Aviation Museum. So this square or rectangle here is where the Aviation Museum is now. 
and you can see it is just starting to be built in the middle of 1943. So when you look at plaques or you look at old websites and it says that our hangar was built in 1941, they're lying to you. Our hangar was built in 1943. Here is a photo from November of 1943 and you can see our hangar is built. So our hangar is hangar M uh, and it was the maintenance and storage depot for number two Air Observer School. So as I mentioned, um, Primarily, the Air Observer Schools uh, employ twin-engine aircraft, um, and by far the backbone, um, most important aircraft for this uh, service was the Avro Anson. So this was the most common aircraft that trained crews uh, from Australia, Canada, Great Britain, and New Zealand, uh, and it got the nickname Faithful Annie. It was a multi-engine trainer that trained navigators, trained bomb aimers, radio operators, air gunners, um, and the funny thing about the Anson is that by the time the war broke out, it was pretty outdated. Uh, it only has two uh, 330 Jacobs engine, 330 horsepower Jacobs engines. Uh, it was meant to be a medium bomber and maritime patrol aircraft, but by the time the war broke out, it was hopelessly outdated. But it was cheap to build, easy to maintain, and easy to fly. Uh, it had good range, relatively good range for a training aircraft. So. They decided it actually made the ideal trainer, and uh, they went into mass production to build it as a training aircraft. It was the first aircraft in service with retractable landing gear, um, which ended up caught, catching a lot of people by surprise. Uh, but fortunately, it had kind of an interesting design, and in that the wings, or sorry, the wheels, actually stuck out of the bottom of the aircraft when the gear was retracted. So it ended up saving a lot of Ansons from really severe damage after belling landings because it could actually still land on the wheels. Uh, I don't actually have the origin of this particular um, photograph, but what's interesting about it is that the propellers don't seem to be particularly messed up. So I don't know if this was a complete failure and it ended up landing on its belly or it collapsed on the ground or what. but. You can see that the wheels are sticking out of the nacelles and it's not um, destroyed. So originally the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan Agreement called for Britain to supply all of the training aircraft, uh, but the numbers were way more than the British factories could handle. So federal aircraft in Montreal began in building Ansons, starting with the Mark II Anson in Montreal, uh, and then McDonald Brothers aircraft in Montreal started building the Mark V in Winnipeg. So Canada built about 2,400 Ansons by the end of the war. Uh, and then after the war, the military ended up unloading thousands of these Ansons uh, as surplus for as little as $25 a piece. Some of them found work in burgeoning bush outfits, and we're gonna talk about that next month, uh, especially with Associated Airways and Tommy Fox. Uh, but a lot of them ended up being bought by farmers who thought they were cool and they sat vacant in farmers' fields. So most of the Ansons that are in Air museums in Canada are ones that were saved by farmers in, in random fields, and there's still a lot of Ansons sitting out in farmers' fields out there. Uh, so our aircraft at the museum is a Mark II Anson, and uh, it doesn't necessarily represent a single particular Anson from the war. It's essentially cobbled together from quite a few of these uh, pieces from, from various Ansons. The Anson is a little hard to get into and a little delicate, so we don't generally let people in for open cockpit day. Uh, so it's not an aircraft that people get to see inside very often, but this was the cockpit of our Anson. Uh, as you can see, pilot seat here. You can crawl uh, through the tunnel in order to get to the nose where the bomb uh, site is. The navigator station in the back. And then I mentioned it earlier, but uh, this is the link trainer. Of course, in 2022, uh, you can probably play a flight simulator on your cell phone, but uh, about 100 years ago, it was a lot more complex in order to you know, be able to fly a plane without actually flying a plane. And so the Link Trainer was invented by an American named Edwin Link. He really wanted to learn to fly, but he couldn't afford flying lessons. And he designed this flight simulator between 1927 and 1929 that used air-powered bellows in order to provide movement to this little aircraft. So it's got an air pump inside, 
um, and that air pump also provided inf information to instruments in the cockpit, uh, and it pretty accurately emulates the displays and feeling of a real aircraft. And because it's, it was initially made for flight training, um, although, sorry, I mean, although it was initially made for flight training, the Great Depression kicked in and it really limited sales. So most of his first customers ended up buying it um, kind of as an amusement park ride. Uh, so they used it as the link pilot, mainer, uh, pilot maker at fairs and exhibitions. But during the 30s, there was a lot of accidents, uh, especially in the United States, owing to poor weather um, and instrument flying conditions that the United States Army Air Force decided they really actually needed to look at a more efficient way of training pilots for instrument flying, and they revisited the link trainer. So they ordered six in 1934, which further expanded sales um, to other commercial airlines and other air forces. So the link trainer, the bellows could pitch, roll, uh, rotate the aircraft. There's an intercom system and a duplicate set of instruments so that the instructor can see what's going on with the pilot. Um, the instructor has controls at their desk so they can change the wind speed, wind direction, and a signal is mechanically re relayed from the link trainer through a cable to this plotter uh, on the table. So as the aircraft is flying, it is moving this plotter very slowly and tracing a path with a grease pencil that grease pencil can sit on top of a map and the instructor can essentially see where the pilot is flying in the link trainer. The pilot doesn't have any outside reference with the hood closed, only, they can only see instruments, so they have to rely on their instruments and not their inner ear to tell them if they're you know, flying level or not. So it's kind of an amazing piece of technology uh, and, and very sophisticated for the time. So thousands of pilots ended up learning instrument flying in link, link trainers during the Second World War, not only in the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, but also in the United States. Uh, so there's about 10,000 of these made by the end of the war, uh, including 5,000 of them built in Canada. So both number 16 EFTS and number two AOS, as well as number three Manning Depot had link trainers. Now later, um, so number two Arabs are built, ended up employing Margaret Littlewood, who is the only woman link instructor in Canada, and that's who's sitting in the link trainer in this photograph. I don't know why there is a guy in a skirt. Uh, I don't know if they were trying to represent more diversity by putting a guy in a skirt, but that's a story for another day. So Margaret Littlewood um, was a civilian flying instructor from Ontario, and because uh, so much training was shifted to the military, and in order to help out the war effort, so many civilian flying schools were closed across country, um, and gasoline was rationed that Margaret Littlewood was out of work. Uh, she initially learned to fly as essentially a publicity stunt that was orchestrated by uh, a friend of hers father. Uh, he was a barnstormer, and he, opened, he wanted to open up a flying school. He thought that uh, teaching women to fly would be kind of a novelty and get him a lot of press. So he decided to teach his daughter Marion and her friend Margaret uh, to fly in order to boost the school's profile. So they learned to fly in 1938, and they were both very competent and ended up becoming flying instructors. So she ended up applying as a flying instructor at pretty much every British Commonwealth air training base across the country, and the only person that would return her call was Watt May at, here at number two AOS. So he sent a little bit of telegram with an offer to come to Edmonton to work. So she caught the train and in 1943 to 1944, she logged about 1200 hours of instruction in the link trainer. First in Edmonton, and then she transferred to RAF Ferry Command in Dorval. After the war, she ended up earning a commercial and senior commercial pilot license. But um, even though there were so many women that ended up working in non-traditional war roles during the Second World War, there was a pretty shift, back, uh, pretty quick back peddling after the war uh, and a very short glass ceiling. So she wasn't really able to find work as a pilot despite so much experience and so many um, endorsements. So uh, she ended up re retiring from flying in 1954 with over a thousand hours, um, but she did um, work for the Ministry of Transport and uh, retired in 1980. This is the link trainer display at the museum. So um, the civilian instructor here is representing Margaret Littlewood. Uh, 
Uh, the woman that's at the desk is a bit of a anachronism because Margaret Littlewood really was the only link trainer instructor, but there were a lot of other women that were employed at number two AOS as clerks, medical clerks, um, all sorts of, of other jobs, just not necessarily instructors. Uh, Cedric Ma is another uh, person that worked at number two AOS. Uh, he grew up in Prince Rupert, British Columbia during the Great Depression. Uh, and at the time, Chinese Canadians were barred from citizen citizenship in Canada. Uh, and they were unable to vote. But when the war broke out, despite all of this discrimination, there was thousands of Chinese Canadians that really wanted to serve in the Army or the Air Force. So in 1940, he tried to enlist in the Royal Canadian Air Force, but uh, he's Chinese Canadian. and the Air Force had fairly racist policies at the time that wouldn't allow Chinese Canadians to serve in the Air Force. So he and his brother Albert ended up going to, to California and they learned to fly the California Flyers, sorry, California Flyer School of Aeronautics. They came back to Canada and they started working uh, with Canadian Airways. In part uh, because their father had been friends with Watt May. When the war escalated, uh, they became civilian flying instructors for the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, and they both came to number two AOS in Edmonton and were flying student navigators in Avril Anson's. And so a couple years later, at Watt May's suggestion, they ended up spending two years working for the China National Aviation Corporation in China, which is a subsidiary of Pan American Airways, sorry, Pan American Airlines. So they were flying supplies and passengers from India to China over the Himalayas, which was called the hump at the time. They're flying in unpressurized uh, Curtis C-46 Commandos and Douglas C-47 Dakotas uh, over a 6,000 foot mountain range. Uh, the, there was extreme winds, lots of storms. Um, there was Japanese fighters that they had to dodge in unarmed transport planes. Uh, and despite these hazards, Cedric Ma ended up completing 337 flights over the hump, uh, which ended up earning him uh, the Distinguished Flying Cross, excuse me, from the United States. He came back to Canada in 1940. Well, he, sorry, he came back to Canada, returned to China. He flew for China Air Transport Corp. Uh, and then he came back in 1950 to Canada and worked as a bush pilot, first in British Columbia, and then a charter pilot for Gateway, Every, Gateway Aviation here in Edmonton. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the post-war uh, talk. But um, I never met Cedric Ma myself, but he was a volunteer here at the museum and, and very beloved by people here. We talked about uh, Mackenzie Air Service in June. Um, Brittnell's contribution to the Second World War here in Edmonton was that he formed Aircraft Repair Limited in 1936. This was the maintenance arm of Mackenzie. And it's really at Aircraft Repair that Brittnell's talents shone because he was such an amazing manager. So during the war, Aircraft Repair serviced aircraft for the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan uh, here in Edmonton. They winterized American lend lease aircraft on the way to the Soviet Union. Aircraft Repair was uh, renamed Northwest Industries in 1943, and that both companies were really, really known for their perfection and efficiency. Uh, it's kind of a famous story, but so many aircraft ended up passing through Edmonton uh, because of the Lend-Lease program that Edmonton became the busiest airport in the world for a single day. So we had 860 aircraft land in a single day. That huge influx of military aircraft really helped grow aircraft repair slash Northwest Industries. Um, and at their peak in 1944, they employed 2,300 men and women. So Brittnell continued to manage Northwest Industries until 1947. Um, then he ended up founding Arctic Airlines as an aerial photogra photography operation. Uh, and then he retired in 1952. So I'm just gonna skip over these because we are running out of time, but uh, Mackenzie had a lot of service in the north. And as I mentioned, aircraft repair employed 2,300 men and women. And they employed a lot of women in non-traditional roles, so including mechanics, electricians, uh, and sheet metal repair. Uh, Nora Hook was one such woman. Uh, we put together a video, well, Steve put together a video about her recently. Uh, she was hired in 1941 uh, she had previously worked at the GWD garment factory, and she went to work at aircraft repair because they heard, heard that they were hiring women, expecting to be put to, get, put to work in the fabric department, uh, but it wasn't meant to be. So her acceptance 
acceptance slip just said miscellaneous so she showed up her starting pay was 30 cents an hour uh, and on the first day of work she got handed her handbook of rules and escorted to the sheet metal department so she was in the first group of women that were trained on sheet metal repair to either see slash prove that women could be trained for sheet metal work and of course they could so their first job was filing um, not documents but uh, washers so she, she ended up working as the sheet metal repair person at aircraft repair I'm just going to mute myself so you don't get a bunch of feedback. because we're running out of time, I'm just going to skip ahead of it. Uh, so I talked about Yukon Southern back in June and uh, established by Grant McConkey. He was starting to fly regular mail and passenger flights to Whitehorse um, from Edmonton starting in 1937, uh, first with United Air Transport and then Yukon Southern Air Transport. So they're using float planes in the summer, skis in the winter. Um, and he started to realize pretty quickly that year-round operations using runways was a lot more economical. Only Whitehorse, though, had a year-round year -round runway. Um, otherwise, northern airstrips were pretty much non-existent. So in 1938, he hired uh, crews to start clearing airstrips in Fort St. John and Fort Nelson using tractors and horse teams. The next summer, um, they cleared an airstrip at Watson Lake. Um, and then the Federal Department of Transport decided to develop an aerial link between Edmonton and Whitehorse based on routes that had been established by bush pilots um, and as a consideration of the shortest route to the Orient, which is the Great Circle route. So he's pioneering this route up to Yukon, Alaska, and the Orient, um, building on the work that had done before, 
uh, including a 1931 flight by Charles Lindbergh, but also by Canadians. So Alexander McLean uh, was from Ontario. He moved to Innisfail, um, went to Calgary, and then the U of A for school. And he joined the Canadian Air Force Reserve, got his commercial pilot license, um, and then went back to his dad's business until 1927. He worked mainly out east doing airmail and aerial photography. And then the Department of Defense hired him in April of 1929 as the inspector of Western Airways in Regina. And he was mainly responsible for constructing airways across the prairies, so from Winnipeg to Calgary, Regina to Edmonton, building a series of airports um, between these major centers and upgrading them with the right lights, weather services, radios, that kind of thing. In July 1935, he was in charge of a, an 11,300 kilometer survey flight down the Mackenzie River, uh, through the Great Bear Lake region, Yukon, and Northern British Columbia. So they left South Cooking Lake near Edmonton, uh, they stopped at Fort McMurray, and then all points down the Mackenzie River to Eklavik, back the, through the Yukon, Northern BC to Prince Rupert, all for the purposes of checking, uh, landing, and other facilities connecting with air traffic. The pilot on that flight was Punch Dickens, um, and he was flying a Canadian Airways Fairchild 71, which happens to be now in the museum. So the survey flight um, from Edmonton to the Alaska border showed a natural airway from Edmonton through the Yukon to Alaska and then onto the Orient. And the route that he chose uh, passes through Fort, Ch Fort St. John, Fort Nelson, and Whitehorse as the shortest distance between um, Chicago and Shanghai, by uh, which is about 4,000 miles. And if you look at a, a flat map, you might think, let's say, the shortest distance between Edmonton and Tokyo looks like this. But uh, it's a distorted map um, because we're trying to project a sphere onto a flat piece of paper. So this is actually the shortest route from Edmonton to Tokyo. Uh, it's called a Great Circle Route. So it actually goes northwest through northern BC, part, part of Yukon, Alaska. And obviously, uh, you know, you have to do the best with what you get. So from Edmonton, he's got Runways built at Fort, Fort St. John, Fort Nelson, Watson Lake, Whitehorse, um, which are pretty close to this Great Circle route. A lot of the uh, work ended up becoming very important for the Lend-Lease program. So thousands of American warplanes ended up coming through Edmonton during the Second World War, uh, mainly the Bell P-39 Era Cobra. So the, Lent, the American Lend-Lease Program was supplying military aircraft to the Soviet Union, which was an ally at the time uh, in the fight against the, so the Nazis. So the U.S. and Canada set up airstrips every 160 kilometers between Edmonton and Fairbanks to build the Northwest Staging Route. So building upon that work that Yukon Southern had already did, they just expanded it and built even more regular um, staging routes, fuel depots, that kind of thing. So American pilots ferried about 8,000 aircraft to Alaska, Soviet pilots then took over and then flew them to the Eastern Front. They stopped in Edmonton and aircraft repair modified and serviced the aircraft uh, in order to survive the extreme conditions in Alaska and Siberia. The Bell P-39 Era Cobra was one of the first fighters built around a specific weapon uh, and it's shown here. It's the 37 millimeter M4 autocannon. So it's an enormous gun firing armor-piercing rounds that weigh about half a kilogram each they can penetrate armor up to two centimeters thick, or almost an inch thick at 500 meters, or they could fire high explosive shells, which would rip apart an aircraft in, with a single hit. It was way too large and way too heavy to mount uh, in the wing of an aircraft, so the only real place to mount this was in the nose of the aircraft. Obviously the nose is where the engine typically goes in a fighter plane. So they ended up moving the engine behind the, po behind the cockpit uh, it's got a drive shaft that passes underneath the pilot, underneath the gun, hooks up to a transmission and drives the propeller. Unfortunately, design compromises resulted in a fighter that lacked high performance altitude, uh, high altitude performance, excuse me. So the Allies really needed fighter planes that could escort heavy bombers on the Western Front. And the P-39, because it lacked a second stage supercharger, had really poor high altitude performance. On the Eastern Front though, the Soviets didn't really care about escorting high altitude bombers, so they really, really liked the Era Cobra. So uh, even though the Allies hated it, the Soviets loved it. So from its their factory in New York, uh, they would go to Montana, up to Edmonton, and then from Edmonton up to Alaska, and from Alaska to the Soviet Union. A lot of these aircraft 
so it was not just P39s, but um, A20s, B25s, DC3s, a lot of them crashed along the way. Uh, we're currently restoring a P39, which is using parts from a P39 that crashed near Wetaskiwin. So Stan Reynolds of the Reynolds Collection, or Reynolds Museum fame, salvaged that wreckage. Um, it became one of like a million things in his collection. And the P39 that we're restoring is going to be incorporating uh, as many of the parts that we can into of that aircraft into the one that we're restoring. So here's a variety of Lend-Lease aircraft parked outside of Number 2 Air Observer School during the Second World War. So mainly P39s, but a couple of uh, C-47s as well. And here's our aircraft under restoration. So the other thing that happened, um, let me started para jumping. I'm like 15 minutes over though, so I'll skip and talk about it next time. So when we come back in the end of September, um, we're going to be talking about uh, the Cold War and uh, essentially military aircraft after the Cold War, I, I think. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think we're talking about the Cold War next, and then after that we're going to be talking about um, civilian flying and bush flying after the Second World War. So. Sorry for going over so long, but if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to hang out and answer them. Hey, Ryan, one question. The picture of Margaret Littlewood and the airplane, what plane is that? Uh, I don't remember. I guess a Fairchild Cornell, maybe? Okay. I think. Looks sort of like a Navy on, but it's the wrong era, I think. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to look it up. Ryan, I came to Canada in 1967. I farmed out the other side of Smoky Lake. Uh, I used to come in to Edmonton about once a week, and I would go back out to the farm on Highway 28, which starts out at uh, 97th Street. <laughs> on the way out, I would collect groceries. I, whether it was a Safeway store, I have no idea. But in there, they had a Link trainer. Hmm. So I actually got to experience flying in a Link trainer in, in a shopping center. Yeah, cool. Uh, How was it? Bloody awful. <laughs> <laughs> I cr I, it was actually started by, well, you mentioned Edward Link, and he actually made vacuum cleaners, which is why it's operated by a, an air system. Yeah, that company actually got started with um, pipe organs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah our, the so the two uh, link trainers that we have, the the one that looks nicer is actually operational. Uh, so okay. so Gary restored it to operational condition, but you know it's really hard to get into, and you know there's no graphics. Uh, it's not hooked up to the controls of the control table, so we don't really let anybody into it. But you know th theoretically we could. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing where compared to like a modern flight simulator, you know, unless you know, like the historical reason of what it is, it, yeah. it's not particularly interesting to most people, yeah. unfortunately. Ryan, an airport I flew into at one time, and I don't hear much about it, is Airdrie. Looked to me like it was a BC ATP airport as well. It's just north of where Calgary International is, or it was. Yes, I can't remember about that one specifically. I mean, Calgary had a couple of air bases at the time. Like, there's the International, um, and they had a smaller one which is no longer there, uh, which is their initial airport, and they had some BC ATP facilities there. I can't remember if Airdrie had a facility or not. In my office, I have a list of, of all of them. Yeah, I just remember the, the runway layout was exactly the diamond shape or the triangle shape. When I landed there, the runways were in really rough shape. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's interesting. Whatever. There's uh, there's a website that like kind of catalogs all the abandoned BC ATP air bases across Canada. Uh, with satellite photos so some you can see that like they're totally gone but even in the crops you can see the remnants of the triangular pattern because and even though the runways have been ripped up it still affects the crop growth 
over top of them. So you can still see kind of the shadow of, of where those runways used to be. I learned to fly in Moncton and there was an AT, a BC ATP training base in uh, De Burke, which was not very far away. If you flew over into Nova Scotia, you'd fly over it all the time. Hmm. I learned to fly in Edmonton, so. Yeah. Unfortunately, the the BC ATP hangar for the flying club burned down in 67, 69, one of those, late 60s. The original BCT, BC ATP hangar for the, the flying club burned down, so I never got to see it. So did Walt May actually have an office in our hangar, or is that a, is that a fiction too? I don't think so. I think that's a fiction. I mean, ours was, ours was really like just a storage and maintenance facility. Um, we have very, very little photos, original photos that include our hangar. Um, mainly they're pretty grainy. They have Anson's parked outside, but yeah, yeah, nothing from the inside showing like any of the interior layout. Which is what Jerry Blacklock used to say, right? Yeah. Well, and, and Denny as well. And, yeah. you know, maybe maybe it was, but... Yeah, there was a lot of hangers here at the time, so it's pretty easy to mistake one for the other. They all kind of look the same. Yeah. With our hangar, we say it's a, a double double. Yes. Now, was it a clear span across that, or was it yes. always a dividing line? So there is um, pillars in the middle, but where the wall is, uh, that wall was built for as a fire dividing wall, essentially. But you could knock that wall down. It's not structural, um, and it's just the the pillars on the inside. So we do have some photos from the 50s from 418 Squadron, and it shows the hangar in that configuration with the, the wall missing in the middle. And there was kind of a little like um, like a little office in the middle, essentially. Sure. Okay. So, the, but there was some support then for the roof in the middle somewhere there, was there? Or yeah, was just there the, it, it was pillars. Oh, okay. uh, there's a line of posts. I think they're yeah. made out of 12 by 4 inch firs, but six of them together okay but it's still a pretty marvelous structure for the size and i'm sure the snow loads and all that sort of stuff for sure and for the longest time we said that we're the only double double left but um there's actually one in quebec i just don't know i need to do some more research and figure out if that one is perhaps completed slightly after the war ended so that what would make us the last one built during the war i have no idea but it's exactly the same as ours Double-double. A double-double sounds too much like something you'd get at Starbucks. <laughs> maybe maybe that's where they stole the idea from. Yeah. Oh, I, I grew up in Medicine Hat, and we have a, a training plan there, I guess. Again, I remember uh, the hangar. <clears throat> then I think they would have just been uh, probably the single ones. I remember a large con concrete structure that we thought was probably a, an air gunnery target hmm. because we would dig around for... Uh, the uh, lead bullets and stuff in the in the sand on the one side. Now, whether that came later with just rifle target practice or actually aerial gunnery, I don't know. But uh, I remember uh, Tiger Moss flying there. Um, so, uh, like, I was born in '41. So, hmm. by the time of the end of the war, anyway, uh, you know, I was uh, a young fellow and yeah. I recognized airplanes overhead and so on. Yeah. Cool. Ralph, you had a question? Well, once again, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry I'll, I'll try and catch up on some of the recordings of the ones I've missed, but it's always fascinating. So thank you much for your, your knowledge and the background. That's great. No, no problem. There's, there was a lot to cover this time. I did not cover everything, but I still managed to go over. <laughs> No, Ralph, you just muted yourself. My question was, there were obviously a number of, uh, of men from Alberta that signed up for air service. And so how were they assigned uh, to, to what um, centers would they be uh, assigned to? Was there a given place like Calgary or Edmonton or did they go to Regina right off the bat or it was a common 
a combination of what had space available and what was close. So it, okay. especially early on, you often went like relatively close to a mining center, close to where you lived, but uh, they would ship you across the country if, if they needed to because of you know capacity issues and whatnot. Okay, yeah. I, I noticed that on a number of uh, uh, air service transcripts that they seem to jump all over the place. Yeah. You know, Regina, uh, Edmonton, uh, out into eastern Canada and back, you name it. Yeah, basically it was like, well, whatever, wherever there's space and wherever they needed, they would just send it and send you there. Okay. Okay. So thank you again. This, this was uh, very interesting. Great. I'll see you all next month. Thank you. <laughs>